Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Biopath Holdings first quarter 2021 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Following the former remarks, we will open the call up for your questions. I would now like to turn the call over to Will O'Connor of Stern Investor Relations. Please proceed. Thank you, operator. Welcome to the Biopath Holdings conference call and webcast to review the company's first quarter 2021 financial results and to provide an update on recent pipeline and corporate developments. Earlier, we issued a press release which outlines the topics that we plan to discuss on today's call. The release is available at biopathholdings.com. With me today from Biopath are President and CEO, Peter Nielsen, and Senior Vice President of Finance, Accounting, and Administration, Anthony Price. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that today's discussion will contain forward-looking statements that involve risks and uncertainties. These risks and uncertainties are outlined in today's press release and in the company's recent filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which we urge you to read. Our actual results may differ materially from what is discussed on today's call. With that, I'll now turn the call over to Biopath CEO, Peter Nielsen. Thanks, Will. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. 2021 is off to a terrific start, marked by substantial progress across our portfolio of targeted nucleic cancer drugs. We are excited by the advances we've made, but are even more excited by what is to come for Biopath. Let me now turn to discuss these advances and opportunities in greater detail. I'll begin with our lead product candidate, Prexigibrosum, where we continue to make solid progress. In April, we were delighted to publish an analysis highlighting the potential of Prexigibrosum within the antisense oligonucleotide drug delivery landscape in the peer-reviewed journal, Biomedicines. In addition, stage two of our phase two clinical trial of prexigibrosum for the treatment of acute myeloid leukemia, or AML, in combination with frontline therapy, decitamin and venetoclax continues. As we have previously reported, phase two clinical development of prexigibrosum and AML commenced with stage one of our phase two clinical trial which was open-label and treated de novo AML patients with a combination of prexigibrosum and low-dose cytarabin, or LDAC. The combination of prexigibrosum and LDAC was shown to be safe and more efficacious to treat this class of patients than with LDAC alone. As many of you know, there has been an evolving landscape for standard of care in AML. Despite these new therapies, there are still patients who are refractory or resistant, and those are the patients we aim to help. As standard of care evolved, we adapted our trial design to reflect these changes. The amended stage two of this phase two trial in AML is an open-label phase two, two two-stage multicenter study of prexigibrosum in combination with decitamin and venetoclax in two cohorts of patients with previously untreated AML and relapsed-resistant AML. A third cohort includes treating relapsed-resistant AML patients who are venetoclax-resistant or intolerant with the two-drug combination of prexigibrosum and decitamin. The full trial design plans have approximately 54 evaluable patients for the cohort treating relapsed refractory AML patient with a triple combination treatment of prexigibrosum, decitamin, and venetoclax, and the cohort treating AML patients who are venetoclax resistant or intolerant with the two-dose combination of prexigibrosum and decitamin with a review of both cohorts performed after 19 evaluable patients. The full trial design plans have approximately 98 evaluable patients for the cohort treating untreated AML patients with the triple combination treatment of prexigibrosum, decitamin, and venetoclax with a preliminary review of the cohort performed after 19 evaluable patients and a formal interim analysis after 38 evaluable patients. The higher number of patients in the folder trial design for the untreated AML patient cohort 
is due to the higher baseline response of the frontline therapy with previously untreated AML patients. The primary endpoint for this study will be the number of patients who achieve complete remission, which includes complete remission with incomplete hematologic recovery and complete remission with partial hematologic recovery. An interim analysis will be formed on each cohort to assess the safety and efficacy of the treatment. In April, we were excited to announce the successful completion of the study run-in of stage two of the phase two, which had a clean side effect profile and lack of toxicity. We are also very encouraged by the efficacy signal shown in this data set. With five of the six evaluable relapsed, refractory, and newly diagnosed AML patients demonstrating clinical activity. We look forward to advancing this study as we believe its unique design provides us with several definable registration pathways. As I mentioned on our last call, the United States Patent and Trademark Office issued a third patent in our family of platform intellectual property that offers expanded defense of our de-enabilized platform technology. In addition, we were pleased to receive the issuance of a patent related to Prexigiburacin in combination with either cytidine analogs such as decitamine or the bcr able tyrosine kinase inhibitors, disatinib and nilotinib. This addition further strengthens our intellectual property portfolio and completes our already granted patents. These new patents protect the unique therapy combination and supports our ongoing investment in this program to bring a new treatment option to patients with AML who have limited treatment options. As I have said before, we will continue our efforts to build a fortress of protection around our technology as it safeguards our platform technology and target-specific technology and is a deterrent to would-be competitors who and creates value around our core competencies. Next, I'd like to turn to our planned phase one clinical trial in Prexigiburosin-A in patients with advanced solid tumors, including ovarian, uterine, pancreatic, and hormone refractory breast cancer. Prexigiburosin-A, a a fourth biopath drug candidate, is a modified product from Prexigiburosin sharing the same drug substance with enhanced nanoparticle properties. This trial is expected to be conducted at several leading cancer centers and is planned initially to evaluate the safety of Prexigiburosin in solid tumor patients. Patients diagnosed with recurrent ovarian and endometrial cancer often have poor outcomes, and it is our hope that Prexigiburosin may provide clinical benefit for such patients. Turning now to BP1002, our second therapeutic candidate, which targets BCL2. In April, we presented a poster highlighting preclinical BP1002 data at the 2021 American Association for Cancer Research Annual Meeting. BP1002 targets the protein BCL2, which is responsible for driving cell survival in up to 60% of all cancers. High expression of BCL2 has been correlated with poor prognosis for patients diagnosed with AML. The data presented in the AACR poster show that venetoclax resistant cells are sensitive to the inhibitory effects of BP1002 combined with decitamin, suggesting that this combination is a potential treatment for patients who have relapsed from frontline venetoclax based therapies. Venetoclax has also shown activity against anti-apoptotic protein BCL2 and works by neutralizing the protein's BH3 domain. It is an approved treatment for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL, patients and untreated AML patients. However, with the exception of some patients treated with allogenetic hematopoietic cell transplantation, Disease relapse invariably occurs, oftentimes due to BH3 domain mutation, over time. BP-102 also targets the BCL2 protein, 
However, BP1002 activity is based on blocking the BCL2 messenger RNA and not the BH3 domain. As a result, we believe that BP1002 could provide an alternative for venetoclax patients who have relapsed, including AML patients who previously received venetoclax treatments. Finally, let me briefly review the progress we've made with our third drug candidate, BP1003, which targets the STAT3 protein. This program has shown promising preclinical data, and we are very excited <clears throat> for the future of this program. We are studying BP1003 for the treatment of pancreatic cancer in a patient-derived tumor model. Previous models have shown the drug to successfully penetrate pancreatic tumors and enhance the efficacy of standard frontline treatments. <clears throat> we are particularly excited to launch our first inhuman validation of this cutting-edge therapy in an especially especially challenging cancer indication that has limited treatment options. We are aiming to file an IND application with this very promising product candidate later this year. With that, I'll now turn the program over to Anthony Price for a brief review of our first quarter 2021 financials along with balance sheet highlights. Anthony? Thanks, Peter. The company reported a net loss of 2.4 million or 43 cents per share for the three months ended March 31st, 2021, compared to a net loss of 3.3 million or 90 cents per share for the three months ended March 31st, 2020. Research and development expense for the three months ended March 31st, 2021 decreased to 1.3 million compared to 2.0 million for the three months ended March 31st, 2020, primarily due to decreased preclinical expense related to timing of activities for BP1003, as well as decreased clinical trial expense due to timing of activities for our phase two clinical trial of Prexy Jabersin and AML and our phase one clinical trial of BP1002 in lymphoma. General and administrative expense for the three months ended March 31st, 2021, decreased to 1.2 million compared to 1.3 million for the three months ended March 31st, 2020, primarily due to decreased franchise tax expense. As of March 31st, 2021, the company had cash of 30.8 million compared to 13.8 million as of December 31st, 2020. Net cash used in operating activities for the three months ended March 31st, 2021 was 1.6 million compared to 2.5 million for the comparable period in 2020. Net cash provided by financing activities for the three months ended March 31st, 2021 was 18.6 million. With that, I'll now turn the call back over to Peter. Thanks, Anthony. As I hope we've conveyed on the call this morning, we have made great progress in 2021 that leaves us well positioned to achieve value creating milestones throughout the balance of the year. <clears throat> With our continued publication and presentation of data, we are building a body of scientific and cl clinical evidence in support of our programs while greatly enhancing the visibility of our platform among relevant audiences. It is my hope that with this expanded knowledge of the potential of our de-enabilized platform, <clears throat> we are building a groundswell of interest in our technology and the various ways it can be used. This should enhance clinical trial en enrollment, business development efforts, and more. This is just the start, and I couldn't be more excited about the future of Biopath. With that operator, we are ready to open the call for questions. And ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question at this time, please press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Again, that's star one. And our first question is from the line of Jonathan Ashoff with Roth Capital Partners. Uh, thank you, and congrats on the progress, Peter. Uh, can, can you give us any kind of update on 
uh, the clinical data release timing for PREX and uh, 1002, you know, just particularly over the rest of this year and the first half of next year? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, John. Uh, we, uh, as you know, I've been rebuilding my drug uh, drug supply, and we had a COVID plant occurrence that uh, uh, pushed off some of our batches. So we've, you know, uh, been managing our enrollment to the supply we have. Uh, that will start ramping up uh, starting uh, early next week. And we have several batches planned for the end of the year. Um, with that being said, <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, you know we're over half the ways in one of, towards 19 uh, evaluable in one of the cohorts, and uh, there's a possibility we'll get that readout by the end of the year, um, and certainly by you know I think the first uh, half of the following year would be any remaining, uh, the remaining two cohorts. But uh, we had had pretty uh, high uh, response in treating. We were at one point treating 12 to 15 patients, so but we needed to manage our supply. So uh, that's the, the current view. We've been getting good results. So, I mean, if you recall what we put on the uh, six uh, evaluable safety runout patients, uh, safety profile was excellent and uh, you know we we had uh, positive uh, efficacy enhancement over all of the various uh, frontline treatments in the in the three uh, cohorts uh, it's just obviously it's a small data set so that's that's the view i have right now uh peter what cohort is uh, most enrolled was the treatment naive one uh, currently uh, is the uh, third cohort with the venetoclax intolerant okay. resistant patients. Okay. Uh, and then what's your biggest treatment landscape evolution concern in AML that could possibly force you to redesign the clinical path for PREX again? Uh, you know, I, I'm not uh, really that focused uh, in that regard because uh, uh, whatever – you know the thing that the way it's worked before it's a combination treatment so we obviously adapt <clears throat> if there's a change in the uh, front line because <clears throat> that's typically the way uh, people will want us to configure our treatment option and I think uh, venetoclax is uh, settled in pretty much as uh, as uh, for these treatments uh, the main uh, the main drug uh, treatment that with the satinib, and so uh, I think uh, we're well on the way. The other thing is, every time we've done a treatment uh, comparison or development, uh, you know, preclinically we always show an incremental efficacy benefit. So it's really just uh, keeping track with uh, with what's going on on the front line, and I I view that to be. Uh, a pretty uh, stable thing right now. Certainly in our third cohort where you have the satinib uh, and prexigiburosin, the satinib alone is, is, the, is, the, is the front line for those patients. And I think that's a relatively low bar for us. So uh, I'm anxious to, for us to try to get to that. So, that, I mean, that's kind of my view. Um, thank you, Peter. Our final question comes from the line of Yi Chen with H.C. Wainwright. Hi, Yi. Oh, thank you. Hi. Hi, Peter. Thank you, uh, thank you for taking the questions. Uh, could you uh, tell us the uh, current uh, enrollment status of the Phase one lymphoma and the CIL trial? For the what? For the the, uh, for which? the PP The PP-102 trial? The current enrollment status. Uh, that trial has had uh, one uh, evaluable patient enrolled, and uh, uh, and we're currently, uh, you know, looking at uh, other uh, patients. We have good cancer centers. BP one zero zero two is starting out slow, and the problem is, as you well know, uh, <clears throat> when you do a dose escalating study. 
it's hard to get people started at the low end because the oncologist will say, well, it's, it's a safety trial and, uh, you know, you can't expect uh, a lot of uh, benefit at the low end. I mean, we're starting at 20 milligrams per meter squared. So you have to kind of struggle through those, those early phases. So uh, we're looking to do that. But we had had very, you know, positive uh, responses from our uh, sites that uh, want to participate. We have MD Anderson, Georgia Cancer Center, and uh, Sarah Cannon. Those are all good uh, sites. So we have three sites uh, to uh, do this dose escalating trial. So I think it'll get more rapid uh, once we get up into the higher doses. Uh, do you believe this uh, phase one trial can still record data before the end of this year? Yes, it'd be a cohort. It'd be a, and again, the focus, you know, on the first one, for example, three patients at 20 milligrams per square meter would be, uh, uh, you know, the first cohort. It'd be safety. I, I don't know how much efficacy uh, you can uh, report on that early dose. So it would go from. 20, 40, 60, and 90 are our, our dose points. They may be go to 135, but, you know, I think those first four are the ones that would be the principal focus. So uh, we certainly ought to be able to get one of those, uh, one of those, uh, that first cohort in. Okay, got it. And for uh, Prexin Jabersen A, uh, how quickly do you think? The, trial, the phase one trial in solid tumor can recruit patients uh, in the current uh, environment of the pandemic? Well, there seems to be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is going to be a, uh, uh, you know, a, a treatment for solid tumors that, uh, you know, is systemic, so IV, and uh, uh, endometrial and uh, advanced ovarian are uh, one of them. They can recruit in pancreatic. We've done testing in that. And uh, so the interest has been very high. And, uh, you know, we have, again, MD Anderson in that. Uh, I recall uh, we have a couple others that uh, uh, would be coming in. We uh, – have waited these extra four months. The FDA had asked us to do two more sets of testing, and one of them was the uh, particulates. And particulates are hard for us uh, because of our product being a little bit different. You have to do it on the drug product, which is reconstituted liposomes. And so you have to, for those, you have to go through mechanisms to break down all the liposomes and just get the bare particles and, and some of the things you use um, to do that and aggregate themselves and uh, and, and collase and, and make uh, make it a little more challenging. But we, in fact, have now uh, just got the word in the last week or two that uh, we've got that uh, test successfully done. And so uh, the FDA, in, in the December call we had with them, gave, just gave us the two things we needed to do. So I think we'll get our IND here fairly quickly now because we'll pass this in. And then uh, uh, there's a real need for this, Yi. And uh, we've had, uh, as you know, we've had uh, two AACR papers that were, have been well-received posters uh, uh, at their annual meeting. And so, uh, you know, I think there's a, a lot of interest in getting a, a kind of treatment like this that can uh, help manage that. Obviously, uh, the first part, again, will be um, uh, a safety assessment. Fortunately, since praxiburosin is, is the same drug substance, since the, the formulation is different to get a better nanoparticle, smaller particles, uh, but since that safety is out there with AML, we get to start at a higher dose. I think it's 60 milligram per meter squared, so uh, we, we may not have to go through the hurdle of people not wanting to enroll their patients if they don't think they can get any benefits. So uh, I think we can maybe be better on that as well. But uh, 
everything I know, this is a this is a treatment that's really being uh, looked for. So we can expect this trial to be initiated in the third quarter, right? Yes, and uh, 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 I think we'll get the IND pretty quickly because we satisfied everything they want. And uh, once we get that IND, we'll be opened up, uh, ready to go. So certainly uh, we should be uh, dosing our first patient in the third quarter for sure. Got it. Thank you. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's the end of our Q&A session. I'd like to turn the call back over for any closing remarks. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us and for your continued support of BioPath. Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. We ask that you now disconnect your lines.